I was supposed to meet a friend here today, but I think he's 10 minutes late right now and I don't see him, so I hope I didn't get ghosted. Your call has been forwarded to an automated voice messaging system. Almost everyone knows what it feels like to be lonely. Ugh. And in 2018, nearly half the U.S. population reported feeling lonely regularly. Loneliness is a major threat to Americans' well-being. Leading some experts to say that we're actually in the middle of a loneliness epidemic. This rises to the level of true public health concern. And we often make assumptions about the things that make us lonely. But research has shown that the amount of time that we spend with other people, they just make you less lonely. And the quality of our social skills don't really make a difference. Loneliness may be a greater fear than death. So why do so many of us feel lonely? And what should we do about it? So how many friends do you have? like close friends? Probably like 10 or 15 really close friends who I like talk to weekly at least. Wow. But I do feel that changing. Got out of college pretty recently oh, and that a lot of these people I'm starting to not see that much anymore. Uh, when I got out of college, I would say I had eight to nine good friends. Yeah. And out of those eight to nine, only one is left. You know, as a guy myself, I'm more reluctant to reach out and put myself out there. Yeah. From the studies that I've read, there isn't like a conclusive difference in loneliness rates between men and women, but there is some evidence that women are more comfortable admitting that they're lonely. And loneliness is something I've dealt with all my life. Yeah. So I'm gonna take it on. I'm gonna go online, see if I can make new friends using an app, and maybe that's gonna help out with the loneliness. I swiped through like 200 dudes. Really, and he was and the one? he was the one. So I'm going to a restaurant to meet with Maximilian. I'm a little nervous. What are you nervous about? Sure. Will we click? Right. Just be yourself. Smile. Not like that. That's the... <laughs> See you, dude. Stay dry. Hey, you're Alex, right? Are you Maximilian? Yes. <laughs> Good to meet you, Good man. Good to meet you, man. After you. Thanks, brother. Yeah, dating is normal using the app, but like making friends using the app is kind of, people see it as weird, I guess. You know? Everything about what we're doing is yeah. weird. Oh, yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> what do you do when you're feeling lonely? I don't know, I can't answer that, dude. I, don't know. <laughs> I just feel it, to be totally honest. A couple weeks ago, I was really vibing with this guy because we shared so much in common, and so I was just like, hey, we should hang out, like, in the middle of a conversation. And he was kind of taken back by it, I could tell. Like, he wasn't disgusted, but I just feel like he'd never been, nobody's ever said that to him. Like, oh, no. I've never heard somebody say that before. Yeah. And it takes a bit of time to break down those barriers, you know? It is a little more difficult because it's like, are you going to give up that masculinity by becoming friends with this person? That's the weird thing, is I have no trouble making friends. I'm a very open person. I really just want a tight-knit group of friends. It takes a lot of time to get out and build those relationships. All right, good meeting you. <laughs> it's good meeting you, I'll be brother. in touch. The term loneliness epidemic suggests that this is some modern crisis that is just starting to affect us right now. But the roots of this problem actually go back much further than you might think. In the late 1700s, at the start of the Industrial Revolution in Europe and the United States, people started to move out of small communities and into cities to work in factories. It's around then that you first start to see the use of the word loneliness in English printed works. Loneliness became the first word to describe the experience of being alone. Before that, the closest thing that we had was oneliness, but that just referred to the physical state of being alone. It wasn't until the 1970s that experts started to describe loneliness as a public health crisis, like in these American newspaper clippings where they describe a loneliness epidemic in our time. All of these headlines are talking about this loneliness epidemic in the same way that you would see media coverage talk about this today. So for example, this one says, there is an epidemic of loneliness in America today that drives people to seek companionship in laundromats, shopping centers, Weight Watchers, and bars. That's from 1973. Articles like these were reacting to the start of some major societal shifts. Like when we get married, 
in the US, people have been getting married later and later since the 1950s. And young unmarried people report feeling more lonely than their married peers. And organized community groups like church have become less prominent than ever. Today, a quarter of the US population is unaffiliated with organized religion versus just 5% in 1972. And those who attend religious services less frequently tend to be lonelier. So we can't say that we're lonelier than ever because we haven't really had a consistent way to measure loneliness over time. And we can't say whether those social changes have caused higher rates of loneliness today. But we do know that more people are spending big chunks of their lives isolated from close-knit communities. That's important because our brains are wired to want those social circles. There's one theory that could help us understand the impact that, that has on loneliness. So there's this idea that there is a cognitive limit on the number of people that humans can have basically a meaningful social relationship with. That idea is known as Dunbar's number. The guy who came up with this, his name is Robin Dunbar. What he did to find that number is he basically looked at average brain size of different primates and average social group size, and he made sort of a trend line based off of that and extrapolated that humans probably are meant to be in a group of about 150. And when he double-checked that with modern hunter-gatherer societies at the time, it totally checked out. The average number was about 148. Hunter-gatherer societies were usually 150 people? Yeah. But Dunbar's number is really a set of numbers. So there are a whole bunch of subgroups within this. So the first number is five. This is kind of like the family and friends that you are absolutely closest with. You tend to spend about 40% of your social time with these five people. I want to know who these people are really? for you. Yeah. You're going to make me name check them? So then moving up from this level is what Dunbar calls sort of your sympathy group of 15 people. These are the people I would allow to see me cry. One level up from that is what Dunbar calls the close network. So these are people that you would probably invite to a big dinner party. It's interesting. I would put in this category people I see every day. So I fit in this one? Is that yeah. what you're saying? Okay. Yeah, you go cool, here. Cool, cool, cool. And then the last level coming back to 150, it's sort of the max number of meaningful relationships that you have. These are my casual friends. Mm. For most of human history, you would have lived with these people for almost your entire life. If I didn't live with my boyfriend or if this person lived out of town, mm -hmm. I would not in my daily life see any of the people that I was closest to. Yeah. Which is crazy. Which is crazy. It's important to note that you can feel lonely at any one of these levels. And the fact that we're not interacting with a lot of these people face to face every day does have an actual impact on those relationships. Dunbar said that emotional proximity decreases by 15% every year that you don't see someone face to face. Which means that it just takes a few years for someone who might have been in your top five, say in college, to go all the way to sort of the outer limits of your 150 people. I'm gonna leave this shoot and just book a flight to see my <laughs> yeah. best friend. Exactly. So if these all represent different flavors of loneliness, how do people deal with each of them today? That's what we wanna figure out. We're here in Branford, Connecticut, talking to a group of people called Romeos. That stands for Retired Old Men Eating Out. There's a really strong appeal to groups like this. Research shows older men are more at risk of social isolation when compared to older women. A lot of these guys miss the connections that they had, either growing up or in school or in their working life. They want to find a way to maintain those kinds of friendships in retirement. When I retired, I tried to get in a few things, but nothing seemed to click. Most of the wives have book clubs, yes. bridge clubs, yes. garden, and clubs. garden clubs. And this group was just perfect. We just get together and we shoot the breeze, and it's a bunch of very nice people. Are there moments for all of you that stand out that kind of brought you here? Sometimes it's a relative who will say, I'm concerned about so-and-so being lonely. We get those kinds of contacts all the time through our website. I became involved with the Romeo group through my granddaughter, who did research and contacted Frank. Because of my loneliness, she convinced me to join the group, and I'm glad I did. And you weren't sure about it at first. You came very reluctantly to the first exactly. group. <laughs> loneliness may be a greater fear than death. 
during the day, even if you're a widowed guy, you'll find things to do. When you're home at night all by yourself, when you close that door, no matter how much family you have, there's some point in time when you are all by yourself and you won't know that sense of loneliness until you're there. It's just there's a void. It's like there's a part of you that's been taken from you and there's no way to replace it. So, you know, a place like this takes the edge off of it. Well, this is kind of a depressing conversation. Yes. But normally when we get together, we have a bunch of yucks. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my God, thank you. What? Right. He's too young. What are you doing? I, I feel like I can't. This is uh, cheating. Oh, nice. Get him, his face is turning red. <laughs> Speaking, I guess, to me as a young whippersnapper. Young whippersnapper. Okay, okay go ahead. Are there things that uh, stand out as, as advice to how to build strong social connections that last throughout your life? I think it's rec recognizing that that's not the reality. Each change over time is a transition. It's fluid. Each transition is a potential for loneliness or void or whatever you want to label it as. So I think it's recognizing that's going to happen, and it's in you to make the difference. Do you feel lonely? I'm doing good recently, but sometimes I feel a loneliness so intense that my rib cage hurts, and it just feels like I don't even want to get up in the morning or move. As bad as it is, I don't think you're alone in this by any means. Yeah, it's like something that we'll all encounter at some point. It can affect anybody. Yeah. So we all feel lonely sometimes, but where did this feeling come from? There's this evolutionary theory from neuroscientist John Cassiopo who says that loneliness actually played an important role in the survival of our species. And Joss is gonna help us out with that. Hey, Alex. How's it going? Good. We're gonna take you on a trip through prehistoric times to show you how we used to have to survive. So Homo sapiens didn't survive because we were fast or strong or equipped with natural weapons. What they did have is the ability to cooperate and communicate with others in their group. Hey guys, let's cooperate. So those protective social bonds help to guarantee us safety, shelter, food, and the ability to procreate. Aw, baby. Yeah, baby, what's up? The pain of loneliness acted like a stimulus. It alerted us when our social bonds were at risk and we were potentially going to be isolated. Guys, where are you? So that feeling actually triggers physical responses just like other needs in your body. So like when you're being swiped left on, it's just like, ugh. That's loneliness hitting you in the face. So it was advantageous to feel uncomfortable when your social bonds were at risk because people who felt that were more likely to survive. Right, if you're super comfortable alone, you're probably in danger. Yeah, your body and more specifically, your brain are trying to keep you alive. So if you'll turn to the side, I'll show you how that works. We now know that the pain of social rejection activates the same part of your brain as physical pain. Loneliness is a motivational force coded in our DNA. Just like the pain of hunger tells us to eat, loneliness tells us to seek the safety of companionship. Huh. When you start to feel the stress of loneliness, what? your body releases stress hormones like cortisol, which make us more alert, and epinephrine, which constricts your blood vessels and increases blood pressure. Your heart beats faster to send blood throughout the body. This is what's called the fight or flight response. You may have heard of it. Mm -hmm. It's triggered by the sympathetic nervous system and it's an immediate reaction. It's like your body reminding you that you need your people. Yeah, exactly. All of these physiological reactions like hypervigilance and restless sleep could drive you to reconnect with your group. But the problem is, while these reactions haven't changed all that much since early human history, their context actually has. Make sense? It does. It's not like you're going to run out of food because no one's texting you back. Right. However, this does have tremendous health effects on your body. What we found was that being more socially connected was associated with a 50% uh, reduced risk for premature mortality. The effect of lacking social connection carried a similar risk to smoking up to 15 cigarettes per day, 
Loneliness and depression are not the same thing, but being lonely can put you at increased risk for depression. When you feel lonely, it also affects you socially in ways that prevent you from going out more. So people who are lonely are actually more sensitive to social cues. Those who are chronically lonely also tend to interpret neutral kinds of social situations as more threatening. Wow, so your brain is scrambled, and then as you're trying to reach out, you're maybe reading things wrong. I've been online, I've been offline, searching to try to make friends. Your call has been forwarded to an automated voice messaging system. So Chase was supposed to be here 15 minutes ago. Oh, he's calling. Hello? All right. <laughs> I thought he ghosted me, but he just, he just has train issues. There he is. Oh, hi. Hello, everyone. So glad you made it. Thank you so much. I'm happy I made it, too. So we're going to start off doing a small gradation. So it goes from dark to light. How do you twist your hair? Actually, I use a sponge. I'm kind of losing some hair up in here. It's like, it's getting kind of thin up in here. Black castor oil. Yeah, they also say it's good for beards. See, my beard grows in kind of patchy, so I was Mine like, too, yeah. Like, how many flows of emotional friends do you have? What four. Four. And out of the four, three of them is family. Do you ever feel lonely? At times. It's crazy because the way that the world has played it is that black men can't be openly to one another. Like, a female could say, girl, you look great. You got a nice body, nice shape. Guys can't say, yo, homie, I think that haircut looks nice on you. You're a handsome guy. I you haven't talked to another black like guy that. about hair in a while. I see. Like, like, I find trouble making friends who are, like, have similar interests to me, but also who are, you know, the same as me. So this recent report came out from this group called AEI, mm -hmm. and they found that 54% of black Americans are lonely every now and then, compared to 36% of whites. And they say that's because we all have our own communities and friend groups and we have unique social needs. Mm -hmm. So when you're not interacting with people who are from these same groups, whether it's racial, religious, otherwise, that can lead to loneliness. Yes. Um, I'm about ready to show you. How are you doing over there? Uh, you just promised me you won't laugh. I won't laugh, no. All right, one, two, three. All right. Uh, uh, yours looks phenomenal. Mine's look like a kindergarten did it. I like, I, like, I like your clouds a lot more than mine. Look at the bird. Like, that's no. the Lone Ranger. Like, where's his friends? Bird. Just one bird. He's lonely. I guess he is. And they're gonna fix his little wing. And then they fly in together. All right. <laughs> We are going to talk to Delilah. If you have listened to Late Night Radio, you probably are familiar with her voice. Welcome to the Delilah Show. How are you tonight? Is there someone special on your heart? So you're 21 years old and you've never been in an intimate, loving relationship. I'm Delilah and I do the Delilah Show, which is a nationally syndicated radio show heard in about 200 countries around the world. I've been doing this a long time. How would you describe what is special about the format of radio that lets you have conversations like these? So when people are at home listening to me or driving in the car listening to me, I'm just this sort of voice in the night so I can be whatever they imagine me to be. And it allows me to connect with people in a way that I don't think I could in any other medium. Do you feel like the kinds of conversations that you have with people on the radio have changed? People today, they don't have that inner circle. The one thing that I have noticed the last 10 or 15 years that has changed is the level of desperation I hear in people's voices. So I'm listening for what they're not saying as much as I'm listening for what they are saying. And I believe people are not saying, I hurt. What do you tell someone who's struggling with loneliness? My first question is, who can you turn to? And if they say, I don't have anybody, I'm like, okay, well, therein lies the problem. When you feel lonely, you become more isolated. When you become more isolated, you start cutting yourself off. And after a while, loneliness begets loneliness. I tell them they need to form a real relationship with somebody who needs them. Just step outside of your comfort zone and pretend you're Delilah and ask a few questions. So why are we so lonely? At the most basic level, it's our body's way of telling us we need to reach out and connect with other people. That was true of our prehistoric ancestors, and it's still true for us today. 
I told one of my close male friends that I loved them. It was like the end of our phone conversation. I was like, hey, I love you. And he was kind of like very taken back by it, but he was like, I love you too. I don't know why I've never said that to another male friend. But the time that we're living in also presents us with more opportunities to choose our own tribes. We need to feel like we're a part of something, a part of a family, a part of a village, something bigger than ourselves. So you pick the people that you really want to be with, and you'll never be lonely. That's my story. Yeah. But if you are ever feeling overwhelmed by this, and I know I have, it happens, there's actually links in the description that you can check out for help. Hey, how's it going? Good. The thing to remember is that of all different kinds of emotional pain that you can go through, loneliness is the one kind that you can't solve by yourself. We need other people, and other people need us. Thanks so much for watching that video. A lot of work went into it. If you want to see more Glad You Asked content, check out the videos over here on the right. And if you just want to see more from YouTube learning, over here, we got more for you. Enjoy.